Well, thank you, Neil, for the kind introduction. I understand you all had an early morning, <laughs> a lot of good talks. I hope so. I just, uh, Congressman Peters, saw him going off the floor and heard a little bit of his presentation, which is good to hear. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the Chamber because basically you are the stalwarts of supporting what we've been trying to do. Uh, we missed a golden opportunity last year, but you know, that's, that's last year. Now we have this year and we have this Congress. This is a defining moment. I truly believe in my heart of hearts. This is the defining moment. We get done this year, we don't get it done. Because I don't think by 2024 in a heavy, hot, contested election year, you're going to have this on the, on the front of the burner. Um, we should learn uh, from our allies and what's going on around the world, how quickly people are able to get uh, from conception to, uh, to pr uh, production, if you will. And in the United States, being the superpower of the world, taking so long to get anything accomplished is absolutely ridiculous. And all we've tried to do is look and see what some of our colleagues and some of our allies around the world have done. You have Australia and Canada, takes an average of three years or less. You have Europe, they recently proposed new timelines. Their timelines are targeting nine months to two years to get permit done. Um, and I've said this, Energy security is national security. You cannot become and maintain the super status that we have as far as the superpower of the world unless you have a reliable energy security. And in order to get energy security, we've got to be able to do things. And uh, uh, permitting reform was part of the original bill that we put in, what's called the IRA, Inflation Reduction Act. We've been criticized. Why do we call it inflation reduction? Well, the bottom line was is because it was definitely intended to bring down the prices of what we were consuming. Gasoline was going high. Natural gas, uh, you know, uh, energy prices were going high. We needed to produce more energy. So uh, we wrote that bill basically to be energy secured and balanced. Uh, the main thing is now is we have to make sure that the administration does what needs to be done and the way they intended the bill. They have not. They know I'm in disagreement with them and I will work very diligently and hard. I think this is a perfect uh, vehicle for us to be able to make the adjustments and make sure this administration follows the intent of the bill. The intent of that bill was for 10 years to be paid for in full, not to have games being played with it might cost this and it might not cost this. We knew exactly what we were doing, what we were trying to do. And now to have them, and what I've said before, uh, I know they're uh, their intent was uh, that they wanted a BBB, and I can tell you we killed the BBB, and it was dead and buried, or we thought it was, and they're trying to basically take an IRA and put a lot of the BBB into it as they basically uh, uh, are interpreting it and trying to implement it. Uh, that cannot happen, and it not, should not happen for the American public, and I'll do everything in my power to make sure it doesn't happen. So we will uh, work very diligently on that, and I've said this is the perfect time for us to get something accomplished on this because uh, we have a piece of legislation that you know we worked on and you all were very supportive and I appreciate that. We had 47 votes, we had 40 Democrats and seven Republicans that became politically charged and uh, it was all about politics uh, and it's a shame that that enters into the, uh, to the game as it does everything that we do here in Washington. Uh, also, the perfect can't be the enemy of the good. There's not going to be a perfect piece of legislation. I've been here for over 12 years. I've not had the perfect piece of legislation to vote on. I've had legislation I voted on that changed the direction of what we were doing for the positive, and I would vote and take whatever win I could when I could get it, and I'd work on that to make it better and improve upon it. We had that opportunity. So now what we have is I'm going to drop that bill again, the same bill that we've had 47 votes on, and it'll be dropped as the marker. We will have it in our committee as far as energy and natural resources. We will have hearings. Other committees are having hearings. I understand Senator Carper and Senator Capito were here, and I know they both intend to have hearings in EPW. Uh, I will have a hearing, and we'll have the bill before us, and we'll work on that. I uh, welcome the HR1 coming over. I know you all support it. I support basically having a piece of legislation that we can look at and make our piece of legislation even better. Uh, I think it was uh, wrong for the majority leader of the Senate to say that it was dead on arrival. Nothing should be dead on arrival. There should be basically something that we can take and extract from every piece of legislation when you have, coming from the House, something that we can use and work with and make ours even better. And I think that's the approach we're going to take, and we'll look at this. 
I've always had a saying in, 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 in the political uh, jobs that I've been uh, lucky to be involved with in public service I've been involved. I've never met the first person uh, that is always wrong. I have, I have yet to meet a person that was always wrong. I've learned from everybody, whether it's been opponents of mine that campaigned against me, whether it's been opposition in political parties or whatever, I've learned from every one of them because I was looking of why they would take a position they did and trying to find the best out of that to incorporate it and make mine better or make my position better or make my thought process or a piece of legislation. So all we're doing is improving. We're not going to have a perfect piece of legislation, but we can have a much better piece of legislation. If this doesn't happen here, all the goals that we're all attaining to and would like to have as far as uh, the energy security that we need, uh, the future energy for our country and the world, the difference between us and this piece of legislation we worked on and the permitting bill was in it, the Europeans got very upset because they were seeing all, that, uh, all the investments coming to America. And I mean that they're coming in droves. Every state's going to benefit from this, and mostly the red states that we didn't get many votes from are going to benefit more than anybody else. Uh, but I told him, I said, the difference between us and you, I've been here for 12 years, and for 12 years they have beat on me, different people from different parts of the agenda, about we've got to do cap and trade, we've got to do basically carbon pricing, that's going to take care of the climate. I said, I don't understand how you think that's going to take care of anything except raising the price of goods in America because you're not going to invest the proceeds you get from the taxes to find a new technology it's going to do to basically cure the problem you like. So I told the Europeans, whether it be President Macron or uh, uh, Prime Minister uh, Schultz, Germany and France, we were talking, they were very upset. And I said, the bottom line is we took the carrot and you used the stick. I thought using the incentives that we use, basically trying to minimize the risk to accelerate the new technologies would be the best way to get things to happen that would be able to have new technology that would be carbon, a lot less carbon as far as involved. But I said, we're not going to get rid of something before we have something that will do the same job in replacing it. We're not going to go down the road that Germany went down. We're not going to go down the road that other countries have gone down because of their aspirations. They didn't want this or they didn't want that. And uh, I said, you know, we have to have fossil. We're going to use fossil cleaner and better than anywhere in the world. Carbon capture sequestration, we can do an awful lot more with that. We can do an awful lot more with the methane capturing. But we're going to produce gas, we're going to produce oil, and we're going to have coal in, in the mix. So if it's going to be there around the world, why don't we do it and do it better than any place else has ever done it? Replacing the dirtier fossil in the world with the cleaner fossil in the world, that helps the climate also, as we basically design and basically have the new technologies coming on. Um, I'm happy to take any questions whatsoever that you may have concerning on these issues, but I can tell you uh, I know that the, the time is, is going to be uh, short. We have, a, uh, we have a debt ceiling we've got to get done, and I don't think that that should be playing games with it. But on the other hand, to say that we don't have a financial crisis to the point of $31.4 trillion and growing every minute of every day, not taking that seriously is something that we can't sit and talk and find out how do we get in this position in the last decade uh, or in the last two decades greater than any time in the history of our country, accumulate more debt. Uh, I think that this is something we should talk about. We should try to get a trajectory to where we're going to get that debt under control. My grandfather used to tell me, he said, Joe, he says, and I was a young kid when he said this working for him in a grocery store, he said, Joe, let me tell you one thing. Un unmanaged debt will force you to make cowardly decisions. Unmanaged debt will force you to make cowardly decisions. The old saying, Robin Peter to pay, uh, pay Paul, it's true. And we will be making, basically, justifying this debt. And I can tell you, uh, free money didn't, uh, didn't do us any favors for the longer period of time that we've had. All this is coming back to roost. We better get our financial house in order. It's been said that if we don't, by the year 2050, we will have $130 trillion of public debt. We'll be paying $5 trillion a year just in, in uh, financing it and debt payments. It's just absolutely, absolutely unacceptable. So we're going to be working on all this. Right now, the most important thing we have is to get that under control, but also to get a permitting bill that works. And working with HR1 that came with us with an open mind, going in all of our committees, looking at what we've done in the past, what we voted for. 
We had 40 Democrats and seven Republicans. My goal is to have 30 Democrats and 30 Republicans vote for a piece of legislation that's balanced and it's going to basically take us to a new direction as far as in our country to be able to make the demands. So with that, I don't know how you want to do this, Neil. If not, if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to take them. Yes, ma'am. Oh, hold on, you have, a, you have a mic coming. You're okay. I think okay, it's all on. Right, you can hear me. No, no, from, put, it, put it up close to you. Okay, from there the World Resources Institute. I had uh, two questions for you. We um, have heard from you just now that your committee's gonna hold hearings on this and Absolutely. hopefully come up with a bill, which is fantastic. We look forward to that. But you, I thought you also said that you're gonna reintroduce your permitting bill. Is Did you say yeah, that? Yeah, I have to introduce that. I'm told by my staff that we have to put that back into the mix for we have jurisdiction coming okay. into the Energy Committee. And then my, my other quick question was, um, when you said that um, the administration is trying to take the IRA and make it into the Build Back Better, what, what are they doing that oh my. reflects the Build Back Better part? Well, if you've been reading the paper, I think you will know that I've been very upset, basically. Just, let's, I'll take the EVs, electric vehicles. I never wanted to give the electric vehicles 75 cents credit, let alone $7,500. Okay, so now to make that clear, I says, okay, if you're so determined that you have to have $7,500 to sell your product, I think you have a good product. I think there's an awful lot of people that want electric vehicles. I think that's wonderful. But saying that the Treasury has to give you $7,500 to sell your product, that's not where I'm coming from. It's not how I understand marketing. But I'll tell you what, if you're determined that you have to have uh, $7,500, then the United States of America should get something for it. We'll give you $3,750 credit if you basically uh, source and process the critical minerals that are needed to make that battery since China has about an 80% market share on all this. We'll give you the other 3750 if manufacturing is brought back to America. And that means the product has to be manufactured in North America and the battery. What they're trying to do now is they're just little things, just little things. When I say they, they're expanding, they're, they're liberalizing the intent of what the bill was. The intent of the bill, when they say sourcing and processing, processing the material and then manufacturing it. So it's a, there's a process that goes in there from the processing that goes over to the manufacturing. They're trying to liberalize that and say the manufacturing part is part of the processing. So they're calling processing and sourcing, which means it comes from other parts of the world. Uh, about, we have free trade agreement countries and we want, we want secured pro products coming in from secured uh, sources. That's what they're, to get more product out quicker and everything of that sort. Uh, those types of things there, I said, are so disingenuine. And then they're trying, I'll give you a perfect example. On, uh, we put the, uh, first of all, they didn't get the, the rules out until uh, just recently. They were supposed to be out the end of December, but they went ahead and kept giving the $7,500 credit if you bought a vehicle. All the only thing they did, they pick and chose, they, 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 they cherry picked out of the piece of legislation IRA that the income gaps were 150 and 300,000, okay, as far as income. Anything over that you wouldn't qualify individually or, or uh, married couples. And then the vehicle itself, $55,000 or less for a sedan, 80,000 for a pickup truck. If you look and see what they're calling a pickup truck so they can get the $80,000, they're calling some of these luxury uh, sport EVs, you can't even get a garbage bag in the back of one of them, let alone a, a board or something to carry like, that you could classify as a truck. So I said, come on, get real. So yeah, we have to put some guardrails on because I can guarantee you they don't intend to, and they haven't. And there's more to come. I think over, oh, right here and then over there, okay. Yes, sir, yes, sir. Uh, Chairman Toby Mack with uh, Energy Equipment and Infrastructure Alliance. Uh, thanks, first of all, for your leadership in this whole permitting area. Um, my question is this. We have an enormous amount <coughs> of LNG export capacity uh, on the drawing boards uh, at various stages of permitting, various stages of trying to find financing. It seems to me that with all of that capacity in the pipeline, as it were, uh, we're going to need more um, production and, <clears throat> and transmission out of the Appalachian Basin. Uh, yes, Mountain Valley Pipeline will help, 
but I don't see any way that, that, that we can um, feed all of that export capacity, which, by the way, goes, uh, it's going to be a much cleaner fuel for the world to burn, uh, without building new greenfield projects out of the Appalachian Basin. Do you, do you see this as something that can happen after Mountain Valley goes into service, uh, more projects in the, in the, uh, in the future? Oh, I, I sure I want that to happen. MVP must go into production. That's 2 billion cubic feet a day. When the war started, we were about 1 billion, maybe 2 billion uh, of LNG was putting uh, on a daily basis, billion cubic feet. We produced about 35 trillion cubic feet of gas last year. That should go up to, to about 40 trillion. Uh, we're now about 13 and a half billion a day cubic feet in LNG. We need to get that into the 20 to 30 range as quickly as possible to help the market stabilize it better so that Europe doesn't get caught in the, in the situation that they're in. The whole reason that you hit on right there, the whole reason that, that I even went back and tried to do an energy bill, and I think we were successful if we can get this administration to implement the bill that we passed, not the bill that they want. And when I say that is, is that, you know, when you saw what happened and Putin weaponized energy, and he energized it and our allies were in trouble and we weren't able to help them as quickly as they needed help. If it wasn't for a mild winter, we'd have been in very serious problems. And if we don't get our act together as quickly as we possibly can, it's gonna be a horrible situation for them coming down. And if we can't supply, they'll go somewhere else. And that's what we don't want. The thing that keeps us a superpower of the world is having our allies with us. And you can't be the superpower of the world and not be able to take care of your allies and keep us all together. So I think with that, and this war in Ukraine shows exactly, I just came back from Poland and Ukraine. And if you want to find out what's on the front line, go talk to the people in Pol Poland. They know what's going to happen if Ukraine doesn't make it through this and if Putin continues. And it'll be used, the same as I think Xi Jinping will use his economic power, if you will, trying the critical minerals and things that we have and what they have a control over. So we have to have reliable supply chains. We have to be able to produce more product you know, the whole bill basically tied together. You cannot put a wind farm or a windmill out in the Gulf of Mexico unless we're producing the gas and oil from the Gulf. You can't put basically large solar farms on BLM property unless we're extracting on BLM property. So it's balanced out. The environment and the production that we're needing is going to have to balance. You can't have one versus the other. I think right back there. Good morning, sir. Teresa Pugh. I wonder if maybe you might give some thought to some of the states that have dealt with this permitting question and streamlining, like Michigan and Wisconsin. The Michigan program is in particularly interesting. Thank you, sir. We're looking at everything that does work. And right, I'm saying as the states, I'm, I'm in a situation right now where I have a major company, a major 100, Fortune 100 company putting a, a, a large steel plant in West Virginia, $3 billion investment. And we're getting caught up with the Corps of Engineers and Fish and Wildlife. We finally got by the Fish and Wildlife. Now the Corps of Engineers has given us some challenges here. And it's, there's going to be a, probably an, an additional $2 billion of lost revenue because of not being able to meet the market demands in the time of having that plant completed. That's what we're running into. The state's been very aggressive in getting ours out. But still yet the federal government, if we don't change the federal permitting, you can only do so much with your state laws, you know, and uh, that's, that's really the challenge. And we can learn from a lot of states what they've tried to do. And it hasn't, I'll give you a perfect example. We have mussels, okay, the mussels on the river. I don't know of a person in West Virginia that has ever eaten a mussel coming out of the Ohio River. But by God, that muscle will stop you from building anything you might want to build and maybe creating 2,000 jobs and an economy that we need to diversify. That's the problem we run into. And then, it's, I don't need to tell you all. And NEPA needs to be reformed. We know that. We've all known that for quite some time. I don't think, and in, in, in the congressman, he made a very good point there. After this many years, it has not achieved the goal it was supposed to. Maybe it's time to look at that. And we're not trying to... This whole permitting process, we're not trying to circumvent anything. We were trying to accelerate everything, giving you timelines to do your job. If you can't do your job in time, then get out of the way. We're going to move on. Okay, I know they call that a shot clock in some sort, but I'm sure you once you put that, and also simultaneously, why should you have to go to the EPA, Interior, and all of the different core and every, uh, you know, at separate times? Why can't we simultaneously go to all of them at one time? 
which is, accelerates the permitting process. Let me take one more question if you have it, and then they'll probably give me the hook here. Anybody? Well, let me just say this. Thank you again. This is, you all are going to be the mouthpiece that's going to make this happen. You need to talk to your, your whoever, your congressperson or whoever, your senators of your state. Tell them how important. Just tell them how important it is for us to get permitting, for the United States to remain the superpower of the world, to be able to meet the challenges that we're going to have, especially in the energy challenges that we're going to have and the rest of the world's going to have. Because I assure you, you have anywhere from seven to 800 million people that have no energy whatsoever, no electricity, no nothing. And the world continues to grow, it's gonna demand more. You can see what India's coming on so strong right now. I'll guarantee you, when I went there a few years ago, what I saw in rural India was women and children gathering, gathering waste from the animals and put them in pies and letting the sun bake them. And they use that for their fuel and their heating their home and cooking their food on. Now, you think they're going to matter and be concerned about what's coming out of the smokestack? If they can move from one to the other, the same as we moved way back in the, in the 1920s and 30s and 40s. So there's no reason that they should have first generation, whether it's going to be coal or whatever they're going to use. There's so much more technology. And that's where the Americans, we should be using our, I think, our trading power that we have to encourage people to use the technologies that we're developing. And I think we're going to develop the technologies for the new, cleaner technologies of energy to be used in the next five years faster than any time that we've seen in our lifetime because we're using the incentives. And we're going to basically share the risk with you. And I'll leave you with this. I have always been a firm believer. Government was never intended to be your provider. We were intended to be the best partner you've ever had. And in a partnership, we both should want each other to succeed. That's it. And that's the purpose of us. And then as a government, we have a responsibility to take care of those who can't take care of themselves for whatever type of restrictions they may have. But if you take every opportunity to become a partner, then you're going to be successful. If we think that we have to provide and we're going to control everything as a provider would do, we will not. And that's been my belief from day one. Thank you all. Appreciate it.